Produced by Nintendo and released as a launch title for their 16-bit console, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, Super Mario World was developed by a team of 10 people, directed by Takashi Tezuka and produced by Shigeru Miyamoto. While beginning this project for the then-upcoming Super Nintendo, the team had to work without specific software tools early on, and started by focusing on what they knew the hardware would be capable of, including smoother scrolling and far fewer color limitations. To begin, the team created a port of Super Mario Bros. 3 for the new console, though felt that the improved visuals did little to actually make the game feel any more advanced. Therefore, Miyamoto decided the team would need to create something totally new for the next leap in Mario's evolution. Even dating back to the first entry of Super Mario Bros. on the NES, Miyamoto wanted Mario to have a dinosaur companion, though it hadn't been possible due to hardware limitations. Drawing inspiration from an image on Miyamoto's desk of Mario riding a horse, Super Mario World's character designer, Shigafumi Hino, was tasked with creating a cute reptilian creature for Mario to travel with. Following these themes, the game was also set to take place in Dinosaur Land to fulfill Miyamoto's original concepts. Unsurprisingly, Super Mario World was the best-selling game on the Super Nintendo, tallying over 20 million units sold, bolstered significantly due to being a pack-in title with the console. Even when it was re-released for the Game Boy Advance in 2002, the game sold another 2.5 million copies in the United States alone, becoming the region's highest-selling portable game until August of 2006. Interestingly enough, Miyamoto himself, while reflecting on the game's release, has stated that he felt it was rushed and incomplete by the end. However, that hasn't stopped critics and audiences alike from considering this title to be a quintessential release in gaming history. On top of its monstrous sales, Super Mario World has also been hailed, at release and to this day, as one of the greatest and most highly rated video games of all time, cementing what most of the gaming community imagines when anyone mentions a platforming game. If you've never played this historic title before, hopefully this video will help you understand what's so great about Super Mario World. Our adventure begins while the Mario Brothers are on vacation, celebrating their victory over Bowser and the Koopalings in Super Mario Brothers 3 with a trip to the magical dinosaur land. Just as they begin to relax, our duo discovers that Princess Toadstool is missing again, and while searching for her nearby, instead discover a giant egg out of which pops a dinosaur named Yoshi. This newly hatched ally explains that he and all of his dinosaur friends have been sealed inside of eggs by a band of evil turtles. Mario and Luigi, in usual fashion, set off to rescue the princess and help the remaining trapped inhabitants of Dinosaur Land. The map of Super Mario World, from which players can travel to and select various stages, is remarkably similar to the individual ones created for the lands in Super Mario Bros. 3, though is much more contiguous thanks to the Super Nintendo's ability to render larger images. Upon starting a new game, the player is immediately given a branching path with a choice of two levels. If the player completes the short alternate route to the left of this fork in the road, then they'll discover a large yellow switch that activates specific blocks throughout Dinosaur Land. In the next world, Donut Plains, the player may notice plenty of green incorporeal outlines where theoretical items and platforms would exist to help the player. This prompts the search for the rest of the world's secret switches, as the player will soon enough find red and blue outlines as well that only become more prevalent as the game continues. After defeating Lemmy Koopa at the third castle, the game even prompts you to make sure you've found the red and green switches by then. Despite the four additional buttons to be found on the Super Nintendo controller compared to that of its predecessor, the control scheme for our characters remains remarkably similar to the original Mario Bros. trilogy, with the B button triggering jumping and swimming, while the Super Nintendo's new Y or X buttons now both take on the responsibility of throwing fireballs or allowing our hero to sprint. The A button, however, can be used for a special new spin jump maneuver. You see, the classic bricks from Mario games past have been replaced by new rotating blocks, which allow players to still access certain platforms even after checking for items or coins within a block. However, they can still be destroyed by a spin jump from above. The other new buttons on the Super Nintendo controller, the L and R shoulder buttons, are used to scroll the screen slightly to the left or right for a look at upcoming hazards. One big difference between the presentation of games on the Super Nintendo versus its predecessor is how much real estate you had on the screen. 
Even if a character were reappearing as their same size and hitbox as they had in an earlier NES title, there's still so much more room around them now due to the higher pixel count that more of the world can be shown for both the sake of sharing information and pure aesthetic enjoyment. Though this applied to every game on the hardware, obviously, platforming games greatly benefited from this increase in scale by giving players a little more chance to react to their chaotically moving surroundings. And Super Mario World was no exception, even as the first game to use this hardware. The cave and underwater stages have had clear makeovers to their designs seen in Super Mario Bros. 3, however, the above ground stages have had the biggest overhaul, now going far beyond a solid color or perhaps a few trees and hills in the background. In Super Mario World, there are several possible environments to be seen in each of the overworld stages, such as hills, forests, mountains, and so on, to present the player with enough variety to accommodate exploring an entire new continent. There are a wide variety of unique backgrounds of all sorts of environments to be found throughout Dinosaur Land, and they aren't just a couple screens worth of repeating material either, but often exist for several screens worth of space to either side or even up and down. While the backgrounds are not dramatically impressive compared to some of the visuals that would later be seen on Super Nintendo, those found across Dinosaur Land certainly provide more of a sense of depth than the backdrops of previous Super Mario games thanks to the effect of parallax scrolling. Levels in Super Mario World feature explicitly marked checkpoints known as Midway Gates. Once the ticker tape line of these gates has been broken, the player can continue from that point even after losing a life. Running through the mid-level checkpoint as small Mario instantly turns him into Super Mario as well. At the end of each level, instead of a flagpole, is a giant gate with a moving tape line. The higher this tape is broken determines how many bonus stars the player receives, with 100 accumulated stars allowing the player to attempt a minigame for bonus lives. If you don't actually collide with the tape line at the end of the stage, you only receive a single coin in place of any bonus stars. Each stage also has five large dragon coins, which can all be collected in exchange for a bonus life, alongside the usual coins that fill each level in a Mario game, which still grant bonus lives with every hundred that are accrued. Mario and Luigi can now keep one extra power-up held in stock if they're already in possession of a Fire Flower or Cape Feather, for instance. The stocked item will automatically be released from the floating display box whenever the player is knocked back to their weakest form, or it can be released whenever the player would like with the Select button. Mario's newest and most powerful form, replacing Tanuki Mario from Super Mario Bros. 3, is now Caped Mario, wearing a magic golden cape given to him by Yoshi, and activated in-game upon collection of a cape feather. The cape allows for similar floating and spinning mechanics to the Tanuki Leaf, though also features a reworked and more limited flying ability whenever the player builds up enough speed. Instead of the infinite floating that was capable in Super Mario Bros. 3, Mario will now use his cape as a sort of glider, flapping precisely with his momentum to clear large gaps. Looking back, this feels like a bit of a predecessor to the sort of flying that Mario would experience with the wing cap in Super Mario 64, utilizing momentum to stay airborne as long as possible without any reliable way of gaining altitude. When players hop onto our new friend Yoshi, Mario is able to control him to move and jump more nimbly, as well as eat enemies from a safe distance. Riding on Yoshi also acts as a sort of shield with limitless uses, because instead of reducing the player's power level, and or disappearing entirely whenever hit by an enemy or hazard, Yoshi simply runs away, allowing the player the opportunity to hop back on and take control as if reining in a panicked horse. Anytime the player activates another block that would have produced a Yoshi egg while they're already riding one, the player will instead receive an extra life for keeping their dinosaur companion around throughout the stage's pits and hazards. Enemies that used to give Mario and Luigi a hard time without specific items can be quick work thanks to Yoshi 2, who has no problem jumping on buzzy beetles or eating piranha plants right out of their pipes. As for new interactions for returning enemies, Yoshi will be granted a different power depending on which color of Koopa shell he holds in his mouth. Red shells grant an opportunity to shoot fireballs, blue shells allow Yoshi to fly, and yellow shells allow him to ground pound. Somewhere out there in Dinosaur Land are three specifically colored baby Yoshis, red, blue, and yellow, who have to be protected and fed in order to grow into a full-sized Yoshi. Once matured, these particular Yoshis will have unlimited use of the power coordinated to their color. These companions are far from the only secrets to be discovered along this adventure, however. In fact, virtually every level has some sort of alternate route, shortcut, or secret that often can only be accessed if the player is riding Yoshi and has the added abilities our dinosaur friend provides. 
This incentivizes players to not only keep Yoshi safe for as long as possible throughout multiple levels, but even replay old levels in the search of bonuses that they missed out on when they had played through without Yoshi. Luckily, you can now replay completed levels as much as you'd like. Aside from the extra replayability this offers, even to those who may not be able to progress very far without practice, it also grants players the opportunity to go back in search of secrets and bonus lives. The game's soundtrack and sound effects, as is typical in Super Mario games, was composed by Koji Kondo. Kondo has mentioned being overjoyed at the freedom to use eight audio tracks at once with the power of the Super Nintendo, and chose to exemplify this feature immediately by introducing one instrument after the other in the game's opening theme. He also filled much of the game's soundtrack with returning pieces from Super Mario Bros. 3, though rearranged with new instrumentation. The music has that same energetic vaudeville charm of earlier iconic Mario pieces, and in the same vein, there are even a few short cutscenes at the end of each chapter which feature a bit of silent film-style comedic relief. Kondo even chose to replace the game's sound effects with instruments rather than the crunchy sound waves known as triangle and square waves of the original NES. The use of random percussion instruments for most of the game's sound effects give it a much more whimsical feeling than could have been achieved with the much more limited NES soundboard. I wish I could personally understand what this experience would have actually felt like to play at release. It's really easy to look back on this game that feels as if it's always existed as a stencil for every subsequent platforming game to follow, but this was also the first game to be developed for Nintendo's second home console ever. With state-of-the-art 16-bit graphics and up to 256 colors on screen at a time. The Genesis may have already been out for roughly two years, and in fact Sonic the Hedgehog beat Mario to store shelves in North America and Europe, but this was still a revolutionary moment in the gaming world. As for another notable feature, this was the first Super Mario game to include a save function to return to your game between play sessions, and even swap between one or two players on the same save file upon each startup. Unfortunately, saving doesn't account for any bonus lives you've accumulated, so it also resets to 5 no matter how many you actually had last time you played. The game is incredibly responsive to the player's inputs, and every item and character follows clearly established and easily understood physics. Even objects without a real sense of weight, like platforms suspended in mid-air or booze that float on their own accord, follow very specific patterns and guidelines that makes nothing feel cheap or trivial throughout this game's adventure as you really only need to come across each hazard a time or two before understanding exactly how it combines with the rest of the Super Mario world around it. The search for the game's many alternate routes becomes more and more pertinent as the player reaches later stages, and in accordance, it also becomes more entertaining to look for these hidden exits as the player becomes more comfortable with controlling their character. Sometimes just knowing where the secondary exit is hidden doesn't mean it's accessible before either mastering a certain mechanic in Mario's arsenal, or solving the puzzle of how to navigate a confusing obstacle or clear a gap that seems infeasible. Despite Nintendo's earlier successes featuring their mascot, this entry's replayability has often been praised in comparison to its three much more linear predecessors on the NES. While levels are still expected to be completed in a specific order, an impressive number of secret stages and alternate routes gives players plenty to do without sprinting to the finish. The naming convention of Super Mario World is also quite apt, because it feels as though the whole world is yours to explore in a way that wasn't experienced with the individual linear worlds of the original Mario trilogy. While each area of Dinosaur Land does often follow a theme in a similar fashion to Super Mario Bros. 3, the player isn't locked into that section of the game until completion, and may even find themselves working through three completely separate paths at a time due to this game's many secret exits and alternate routes. Considering the different styles and formats of each of the game's levels, players are free to attempt stages at their own discretion while discovering surprising new sections of Dinosaur Land as unexpected paths reveal themselves. That is what's so great about Super Mario World. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of What's So Great About Gaming, as we bounded into the 16-bit era with Super Mario World. If you want to support the channel, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell, and do whatever else the algorithm demands of us to keep up with our favorite content. Also, consider being a part of the community on Discord, Twitch, or Patreon. If you want to hear what's great about another game, check out the link to our last episode, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, on screen or in the description. And let us know your thoughts on Super Mario World and what games you'd like to see in the future. Thanks again, Thanks again for watching. Now go play a great game. We'll see you next time.